Welcome to uh, the 10th episode of the Lebanese Physicians uh, Podcast. And uh, today uh, I will be uh, interviewing uh, Sarah Chang. Uh, Sarah is a uh, public health uh, expert uh, who, who was in the US uh, initially and had 15 years of experience with the US response to the Ebola and uh, Zika virus. And uh, more recently, she had located to uh, Lebanon where she was actually involved with, uh, uh, with analyzing the COVID-19 response uh, with some non-health actors in the country and has also been involved quite a bit with the data analysis for, uh, for COVID-19. And uh, she has since uh, relocated to uh, Seattle uh, recently. Uh, welcome, Sarah, to the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Khalil. I appreciate it. And uh, I, I, the, the reason I invited you today is because COVID-19 has, has been such a, a big topic in Lebanon over the past uh, uh, month since the summertime, uh, as the caseload has been uh, very high, the positivity rate has been high, and that has translated into uh, a lot of lockdowns in the country and uh, a lot of deaths uh, which are related to that. Uh, so Sarah, do you want to tell us a bit about your uh, your connection, your connection with Lebanon and your move there? Yeah, yeah. So um, my family, we had the opportunity to move to the region, first to Jordan, um, to do some work. And we had, uh, we visited Beirut briefly, and it was such a wonderful place. Um, there was so much energy and so many things going on, and, and the people were so warm. And so fortunately, uh, a couple of years later, we, we actually moved um, for work. To Beirut and just really enjoyed the experience. Um, I think it's such a complex place with so much richness and, um, like I said, so much energy. It's really hard to compare it to anywhere else in the world. It's such a unique place. Um, and at the same time, though, it was such a it's such a complicated place with a lot of complex issues and history. And so I felt really drawn there and connected in an interesting way. Um, and so. Um, even though I've left, obviously I'm back in Seattle now, I, I still feel connected to the people and to the causes and I'm trying to support as much as I can from here. Right, and I can see that uh, through, your, through following your Twitter account. And I think it's funny that I think when I was talking to you, we both uh, probably moved, moved there at the same time and left there approximately <laughs> at the same time. So, uh, so how did you get, so when you moved there, how did you get involved with, uh, with the COVID-19 uh, response and the data analysis related to that? Oh, well, well, like I, uh, you mentioned in the introduction, um, I was actually just doing some volunteer work before. And then when COVID started, I was approached by some non-health actors in uh, the NGO sector um, who were really just struggling with how to adapt to this new situation that they found themselves in. You know, maybe they were used to protracted crisis, um, you know, with refugees and everything else that's been going on in the country for a long time. But with something like a virus and a pandemic, something a bit more acute, um, they needed a lot of help in trying to figure out what to anticipate and how to plan for that in their programs and funding. Um, so I, I did some work on that. And then through that experience, I saw there was a lot of data being produced by the authorities, which was great. They were releasing information and giving people um, some insight into what was going on with COVID in the country. But I think there was, people were still learning, um, learning the terminology, trying to figure out what all the indicators mean and putting it together and, and seeing what it means for their risk and the decisions that they make. And so for that reason, I started tracking the data and recording it in just a simple spreadsheet. And, and presenting the numbers back to people such that they could have a better understanding of what was going on in, in their own communities. Um, and so it's kind of grown from there, doing a bit more analysis depending on what comes up and what's going on with COVID. And so I've, I've, it's been almost a year now that I've been tracking the numbers and it's definitely been a, um, a learning experience and something I hope that others have found helpful as well. Yes, I think it's been uh, very helpful from uh, from reviewing the data they've been collecting. And so, what do you think? I mean, the response has been uh, what I've seen from the responses. When I'm, even when we were there, is it's been a complete lockdown, then then a quick opening up of the country, and then the cases go up, and then the lockdown again, and then the cases uh, go up. So, in your opinion, I mean, with the data you've collected, uh, what do you think would be a good way to manage the situation? Because it seems like it, we are in a vicious cycle at this point with cases going 
going up and down and then reopening and they go up even more. Yeah, no, you're you're totally right. I mean, I'm thinking back to the initial, the, there was the lockdown when COVID first arrived in the country was, was detected in February. And there was um, one of the most intense lockdowns in the world. And then yeah, through that easing of measures that coincided with the reopening of the airport in June, um, you know, it began. That was like really the the truly the first wave, I think, of, of the pandemic in Lebanon. And you're right, there's been this cycle. Um, I've heard it termed, you know, the yo-yo. It's it's this they're going up and down, and kind of the response is going up and down with that. Um, I think it's been hard for people to find a new normal because there's been, I think, some confusion with the approaches and the policies and the rules. Um, it's hard to follow what's going on. And even right now, the country is in a four-phase plan of reopening. Um, but, but it's very complicated when you go through the documents, the very long documents that are released to the public. And so I, I think it's, it's hard for people to follow that. And then of course you have to take it in the context of all these other crises going on in the country. Um, you know, the economic collapse and, and you know, just looking at electricity and food and the healthcare strain, there's so many other things going on. And so I think people are trying their best to abide, but but aren't in a place necessarily to be able to do that, um, particularly for, for families that are depending on income that comes in every day that are daily wages um, and they need that to eat. And so it's been in this vicious cycle. And, and I think there, there has yet to be development of a, a nationwide long-term coordinated plan. And without that, I think it's hard to have a direction for everyone to move together. Um, so it, it, I think that has contributed some to the confusion. And so I, I think you know, hopefully through this year with the vaccine, we'll see some improvement, but it can't just be the vaccine. There needs to be something else in place to help with these mitigating measures or else um, I think this yo-yo effect will continue. Right, I think because of the, because it's, it's a severe lockdown and then it seems like there's no significant assistance from the government to a lot of the people who are depending on hourly wages and that would affect compliance with, with the lockdown like this. Exactly. Yeah, it's a very tough place to have these sort of measures. I mean, even even countries that have more resources and are having a difficult time with compliance, and so um, that that can't be the only way. And if see you've done, I mean, when when you look when I look at data analysis for uh, so far what's happened with the COVID response, uh, I follow your data, and then I follow there's data of the Ministry of Public Health too uh, that they tend to collect on a daily basis uh, with that, but it seems like uh, you analyze also a lot of the uh, data over an, on, over an ongoing period of time. So how important do you think is this data analysis and COVID-19 response specifically in Lebanon, and I guess, uh, in other places in the world? Yeah, well, well <laughs> I mean, I'm biased to being in public health, but data is everything. We need it not only to understand what's going on with COVID, but also to see what's working and what's not. Um, it's a way that you can design and adjust interventions and measures. Um, so, so data is really the insight into what's going on on the ground. Um, and, and while a lot of information is released by authorities, it comes out on PDF documents. So it's not something you can just easily download and, and track over time. It's just these daily reports which I, I know that obviously they're, they're strained as well. There are people that are wearing many hats and doing many other things for the response. Um, so that, that's why I have, as you mentioned, kind of taken a, a zoom out look at it and trying to understand the trends over time that maybe you can't pull from the first page of a daily report. Um, just so you could see, are, are things going up? Are they going down? Is my community getting worse? Is it getting better? And what are the steps that I can take to help contribute to that improvement? Um, so, yeah, I think data has improved over time, but it's still, e even for me, when I look at it, it can be difficult to get a sense of what's going on. And so just trying to wrap my head around it and put it all in one spreadsheet and then try to translate it for others such that they can also understand. And I think just one more question for you. I think, uh, I mean, the, the numbers went up significantly. The hospitals were uh, uh, filled with COVID patients for a while. And I know a lot of friends and, uh, and close and family members who ha had difficulty finding even spots in the hospitals. And this is better now uh, after the lockdown happened, but it seems we reached a place now when I look at the data, I see that the positivity rate of the tests being performed is still around 19% of the tests are still uh, positive. 
Uh, and uh, the numbers are still high. I think yesterday the numbers were above 3,500 uh, uh, mm -hmm. cases that are positive, and the death rate is still is still high. I think upwards of 50 people uh, per day who are unfortunately passing away from COVID. Uh, so where do we think? Where do you think we are uh, at this point with the response in Lebanon? And do you think? Uh, uh, opening up at this point is a good idea, or does it seem like things will increase afterwards? And also, my other question for you is: What do you? What does this positivity rate mean? Is it is it a bad marker? Is it just a marker that not enough tests are being done? Uh, so, what do you think of that? I always struggle to interpret what the positivity rate is. Yeah, yeah, positivity is one of those. That one and um, the reproduction rate, I think, are just uh, they take so many other numbers into account that it gets a bit complicated trying to understand how it fits in the big picture. Um, positivity rate, it, it can indicate low testing, that there's not sufficient testing going on to identify all the cases going on in the community, but can, it can also suggest that there's increased spread. Um, and the fact that there's positivity has been so high for so long, it's been basically, I think, since October, um, when I started tracking positivity more closely, that it's been over 10%, over 15%. And like you said, now it's been closer to 20% for weeks. Um, so that just means to me, it, it suggests that there's large spread and that testing continues to be insufficient. Um, so it's definitely, it's, it's one that you can't just rely on that as a single indicator, but it, it helps understanding the big picture of what's going on. And when you look at the fact that hospitalizations are still very high, you know, deaths cases, they've all kind of plateaued at a very high level. Um, it's still much higher than pre-holiday levels. Um, and then you take that in combination with the high positivity and it seems like things are just, they're, they're stable, but very high. Uh, you want it to come down to, to help contain COVID. Um, so, you know, I know the other part of your question was about what to do from here. I mean, of course, if, if there's an ability to, for people to reduce the amount of contact they're having with others to stop these chains of transmission, and slow down the spread of COVID a bit, that's ideal. But unfortunately, with everything else going on with the country, that's not necessarily something that's feasible for many, many people. Um, and so I, I don't know what the solution is. I think, you know, I'm very interested to see what municipalities are doing and what NGOs are doing. I, I think there are things happening on the ground that are helping communities, but they need to be highlighted, you know, because I know that Lebanon and like other countries, you know, you want to look towards other countries and see what's going on in those best practices, but sometimes those best practices are what's local and what's happening right there. So I think there's opportunities to learn from the inside and outside the country um, to see what's actually viable right now to work with the resources and the situation that is currently happening. Right, right, uh, exactly. And uh... So my, my next uh, question for you is now that the vaccine uh, response has started, I mean, it, it's, it's promise, it's a positive thing. I think people started feeling better, but obviously the number of uh, vaccines that the country is receiving is still very low. I think they've received around 60,000 doses so far, and I think around 34,000 doses have been, have been given. Uh, so one, one thing interesting for me is, uh, and you can, you, can, you can answer that question maybe, is should, should they be giving all the vaccines up front or, or is it better to give half the doses now and wait uh, to give the same people that got the first half of the doses the second half afterwards? Uh, so what's a better strategy, I guess, knowing that I think it seems like they're receiving doses of vaccine on a weekly basis right now? Because it seems like, I mean, when you see 60,000 doses, you're like only 35, 34,000 have been administered. That seems like a low number, right? Compared to the vaccine numbers that they've received so far. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully the, you're right. The, the rate at which it's been administered has been pretty low, but hopefully that will continue to grow as, as these vaccination sites kind of get, get going and that people kind of adapt to the system that has been established in terms of the, the registration through the platform and then booking an appointment, things like that. So hopefully it will speed up. I mean, it's all around the world. It's, it's taken a little bit for campaigns to get off the ground and running. So hopefully we'll see a little bit more efficiency there for the number of vaccines given. Um, but in terms of your question about what should be done, should, should these second doses be reserved? Um, I, I think as long as they know that there are additional shipments coming in of the vaccine, I think it's really just get it out and get it to as many people as possible, in my opinion. Um, even in the US, they're doing that. 
um, kind of counting on more doses to come in. And the thought is at least giving some protection to more people. And there's more and more data in, in these real life where the vaccine is rolling out. It's not necessarily been done in studies, but looking at real life data that's showing that it's, it's not having a bad effect delaying these second doses. Um, so if you can at least give some protections to those who are most vulnerable, most at risk to having severe illness and, and potentially death, then I think that's good for the current state of what's going on in Lebanon, where, where so many people are being affected. If we can at least protect more of the community, I, I think there will be a health benefit to that. And I think hopefully it, it seems like it's going in a good direction now. There were some problems initially with people getting the vaccine outside of the platform, which obviously is not a good thing, uh, but looks like this has been, for the most part, hopefully fixed at this point and should be helpful. And uh, yeah, and one, one other thing I think that I've discussed with you before is, it seems like some private entities will also be importing uh, some vaccines uh, like Sputnik V and Sinopharm. And uh, do you, I mean, we were discussing that, what in your opinion is that, uh, a good thing, a good thing, or is it in some ways a bad thing because it may favor people who have more money to pay and get vaccinated and potentially uh, uh, go ahead of the line or, or are vaccinated ahead of others who need the vaccine more? Yeah, I, uh, I share your concern. I mean, I, I think any added capacity, knowing that in terms of the government side capacity is, is limited because they've been strained for a long time now. So I think pulling in additional actors, including the private sector could be helpful to add capacity, but I definitely agree with your concern in terms of alignment with vaccine priorities set forth by the country to ensure that it targets those who are most vulnerable, you know, whether it's um, older people or healthcare workers, you know, if you have private entities bringing it in, they're gonna have different incentives than the government would in terms of providing this vaccine. Um, and, and there would be a reliance on the private sector also for registering everything. Um, you know, they will be responsible for like collecting that data and making sure it goes out safely, the doses are administered safely. Um, so it really would have to be a partnership that still provides direction under the, the authority of the Ministry of Public Health. So there still has to be some communication and coordination there. And based on how the response has been going so far, I mean, you could just look at testing. So there, there's public testing available to hospitals and other like government approved places. And then there's testing that occurs and, and other places, uh, pri some privately. And um, there seems to be very little coordination and communication there, which I worry has contributed to this patchwork response that is not helping the entirety of the community health. Um, and, and I think you're right. And especially somewhere where there's an economic collapse, a financial crisis, uh, it, if you have those types of structures in place, it's going to favor those that have the resources to access that system. Um, and I think in order to really combat COVID, we have to get out of that. We've seen that taking that approach is not going to help in terms of helping all, and particularly those who are most vulnerable from the severe effects of COVID. So I think it's good to explore. I'm, I'm glad that that door is open. And I think there's opportunity to plan ahead and think about what that will look like to make sure it benefits the country, everyone, and particularly those most vulnerable. That, and because, because one thing we forget all is discussing in Lebanon too is there's a, uh, the country has approximately 6 million people and probably around 2 million of them are, uh, are refugees. And they're, they're very vulnerable. And I, and, I, and I feel the vaccine distribution has not uh, gotten to them at this point uh, yet. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. And um, it seems like looking from the numbers of registration, there's also not a lot of registration yet at this point, um, which is understandable to me, given perhaps some hesitancy and some worry with authorities, perhaps distrust of the vaccine. And I'm sure there's many reasons that people haven't necessarily enrolled yet. Um, so I think there's opportunities to not only just provide communication, but partnership to understand those reasons and to actually address them in, in the plan of the rollout of the vaccine. Um, so yeah, I think you're right. And hopefully there will be opportunities move, moving forward to think of the population as a whole and not in these different segments. Yeah, and one of the things I think people always talk about, we wanna reach uh, herd immunity, which some people say is around 80% uh, of the population getting infected. 
although it's in question now, like in certain areas like Brazil or, or, or some cities there, with these new strains coming out, like you're wondering now is, are you getting herd immunity from one strain, but then getting uh, less immunity to the other strains? That, that's, that's one of the problems, I think. And the other thing is when you look at Lebanon, I think, and you can correct me, I think in some areas that are that were most affected, it's still like anywhere from like maybe 12% of the people are have been infected. So there's still a lot of people that are not infected and it's it, and and we can see that it's affected the country significantly, even with the 12% of people in some areas uh, being positive at this point. Uh, yes, so would you, completely. Yeah, exactly. So would you agree with me that we, we can say, I think the vaccine is probably the, the best way uh, of, uh, trying to get to herd immunity at this time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, herd immunity through vaccine is the best way to prevent death and and also reduce severe illness. Um, and it, to me, herd immunity is a very elusive thing. Like you said, you know, there's this theoretical percent that experts are kind of working with, but it's gonna we're not gonna know, and it could continue to evolve, like you said, because of the variants that if they're more transmissible, then it's gonna require a higher percent of the population to actually have protection. Um, so for me, and especially looking at how the rollout is going so far in Lebanon, I think adjusting those expectations that it's not necessarily herd immunity this year, which, which I know is the goal of authorities, but even in looking at how many vaccines have been um, reserved, we, it's, it's not possible right now. Only about half of the country could be vaccinated by the end of the year, assuming that they could administer all the doses. So for me, I think the, the goal I, I would want is that reduce as much as possible these deaths and severe illnesses that are, of course, impacting people and impacting families and communities, but are also putting such a strain on the healthcare system. If we can at least get enough people immunized to then reduce the strain on the healthcare system, that will benefit everyone from COVID to other health conditions. Um, so I, I think herd immunity is a great goal. Um, I don't know what that looks like in the future, but I think in the meantime, just trying to reduce deaths and severe illness is really, at the end of the day, also gonna have a great impact on people. And of course, I mean, with, with that, I think social, we can't, we can't, we can't overemphasize the importance, I guess, of social distancing that should continue despite the vaccination campaign, uh, because that probably will help with some of the opening up that's going on right now. All right. And uh, so, so one, one, one question for you is, uh, will you continue, how long will you continue to be involved with uh, with data analysis uh, for Lebanon, I know you you, you speak with a lot of the non-governmental organizations. You you write in certain uh, publications, right, such as Al, Al Rawi uh, uh, magazine. Uh, and are you going to continue to be involved with this over time, or what do you think? What are your thoughts? Or will you say, you know what, I'm I'm moving on to something else at this point? And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, for for right now, like this is. This is something that's so important to you and I'm very committed to. I, I have to admit it's it takes a lot of time and energy and it's it's draining um, to track all of this uh, and just looking at the numbers every day and seeing the impact on people's lives. It's, it's hard. I mean, we're all going through this pandemic together um, and it's difficult. But for me, I feel very drawn to continue tracking this to make sure, you know, to play my part and helping others understand what's going on with COVID. And so, you know, I will continue as long as I can and as long as I have the energy and the bandwidth. And um, I, I so appreciate the opportunities of you and others to contribute to the conversation. I feel so honored that I'm able to take part in it and think about what could the response look like and how can we best um, support people in Lebanon. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, for a lot of your work. I think it's, it's very helpful. Uh, uh, for Lebanon, and uh, and I will end it also with so how, how's how's the adjustment in Seattle? Are you are you adjusting well right now? <laughs> yeah, no, it's nice. I mean, I I'm closer to family now, which is fabulous. I love it. Um, but I have to admit, it's been a long adjustment because uh, you know I, I moved after the blast, and so I, I think there's been a lot of processing of of my experience in Lebanon and and in the region, um, and trying to reconcile that with this reality I have here in the US. Um, and so it's been good. I, I, I love it here. There's so much green and, and the rain is comforting. Um, but I, I do think about Lebanon a lot and hope I can return again in a better chapter. Right. I think I think we all have that uh, 
it's, I mean, me too, I'm here. It's, it's, it's very nice and it's, it's very comforting, but uh, I think there's something about Lebanon that attracts, uh, attracts us all uh, there. Uh, so, so thank you very much for, uh, for uh, accepting uh, my invitation for the podcast. Uh, it was great talking to you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you again for having me. I appreciate it.